Thank you all. Can you hear me okay? Am I, am I on? I'm on. Yeah, it did. It's very Scotch winter. I couldn't quite find my way from the visitor center to the Carter Center, and people were like, look at those two lampposts and the mist. And I was like, it's Narnia here. <laughs> Uh, it's so nice to be here. I've never been to Covenant, um, but like uh, Derek just shared, I have been shaped by several of its graduates, both in my own undergraduate experience at Wheaton College, as he said, and then subsequently a bit in the think tank world um, in DC over 15 years ago. I also have um, this really pristine memory. I have never been to Covenant, but I have been to Chattanooga of witnessing the first wedding that I can recall attending as an adult. A dear friend of mine uh, from Wheaton days, wed here on Lookout Mountain, probably, I don't know, 20, 2005, six or so. And it was a memorable affair, not only because the character of the two people marrying each other was just so uniquely translucent and strangely holy, I thought, but rather by partly also because of a unfortunate string of events. In the bachelor party, days before the wedding, the groom-to-be was, I think, enjoying some kind of barefoot water skiing with his buddies, and he somehow cut up his foot on some bacterial substance. He wound up in the emergency room, and I'll never forget the ghost look of physical agony and spiritual commitment as his beautiful bride walked down the aisle, their vows of sickness and in health tested a lot sooner than most marriages um, have to experience. He did make it through the ceremony, looking pained, but devoted. And then halfway through the beautiful reception that felt like this like living reincarnation of these hills that reminded me of like Sound of Music and that scene of Maria Von Trapp spinning at the beginning of that movie, the groom had to be carted back off to the ER while his beloved bride soon joined him there, leaving the rest of us to keep dancing to bluegrass and enjoy their cake. So for any of you who are engaged, please keep your engagements. This is not meant to you know, make you get terrified. It, it actually can be a beautiful affair. And we were left there as friends, as a celebrating crowd, to the graciousness of the bride's parents, who hosted us at their home for the remainder of the time and let us reminisce about these two saints who had just become one who had served all of us as friends and made us alive. And something from just start to finish, the beauty of these hills, the humility of the couple's glow, even amidst pain and sort of disorientation of this injury, the sacredness of the ceremony, and all of this amid sort of the mess and the limits of our bodies that fail us and betray us at, at what sometimes can seem like the most inopportune time. I just couldn't have asked for a better portrait of God's gorgeous wink around marriage, but really more about life and friendship and commitment and the wrinkles in human hope, as I was then a very impressionable and undeniably romantic 21-year-old. And I tell this story to you because, yes, it always comes to mind when I hear someone say Chattanooga or Lookout Mountain, but I also tell it because I think there's a principle embedded within it that has been encouraging my own weariness of late. I kind of feel like, you don't have to agree with me, but it sort of has felt to me lately like the world is a little bit on fire. Ukraine is being destroyed, and there is threat of a larger war, even world-ending nuclear war. COVID still lurks in the background, Many of us are stressed by what feels like a social minefield of verbal faux pas and ideological suspicions when trying to dig into deep-seated pain points in our common life and in our country's history. Violent rhetoric is blowing from the fringe a little bit more to the mainstream. Anxiety is at record highs. Racist acts are reportedly on the rebound. Friendships continue to erode just to lack of attention, I think, and just the long tail of co social distancing. We have grave effects of climate change coming our way over the next 50, 60 years, and the actors who might help our world address it can't seem to unify sufficient political will. And just about everyone I know is confessing a severe depletion in emotional and mental bandwidth. We just can't do or feel or serve any more than is already being upon us, being put upon us. Whether you're a stay-at-home mother or an organizational leader or a nurse or a pastor, everyone is just reporting, feeling spent and maybe even a little bit numb. And I think we are both of these things, spent and numb, in part because there is no longer a real buffer between our day-to-day -day duties and the forces rumbling our world. 
sort of the zeitgeist that has snuck into our homes and our relationships, our work and our sleep. What was private is often now public, and what is public doesn't know any peace. There was an article that went viral a number of months ago. Some of you may have seen it. It was titled, The 37-Year-Olds Are Afraid of the 23-Year-Olds Who Work For Them. And I'll just say I am 37, so I'm terrified of all of you. Um, and it was about the different habits that you and your peers are bringing into the modern workplace. Sort of HR departments, I feel like every generation are serving on the front lines of adjusting expectations as each generation brings its ideals, its personality, and its pain points to bear on organizational cultures and, at least today, what those organizations should be for. A line that really made me chuckle in the article, it was this, the reporter spoke with the co-founder of a company called Plant People, some of you may know of it, I, did, I didn't know of it, but it's, I guess a certified B Corporation, and the co-founder, who sounded like a guy about my age, so sort of entrepreneur, had said this, he said, you know, I talk to older people in our organization and they're like, dude, we sell tomato juice, we don't sell politics. Then we have younger people coming in, and they're like, these are political tomatoes. This is political tomato sauce. <laughs> it's not just young people who are blurring the lines of what should be expressed where. College faculty around the country increasingly un understand their roles to be advocates of a particular cause rather than as seekers of understanding. Debates around various forms of critical theory have spilled into the public domain via Twitter and elsewhere, when the tools for using it productively are known only by a trained few, actually. When people these days ask something like, what church do you attend? It seems a lot more oftentimes loaded with political suspicion than spiritual care. It seems clear that the vast majority of citizens today are just chafing against a poverty of choice when it comes to those vehicles that can channel our noblest moral longings. Worshiping beings, and we all worship something, whether we know God or we don't, invariably pivot if we are left hungry at the altar, especially in a culture drenched in market competition like ours. Today, the fact that those spheres that have historically helped organize, if not catalyze, a propulsive moral witness in our society, you think about the faith community's role in the civil rights movement, the government's role in expanding the vote to women and to people of color, journalism's role in exposing Watergate and other leadership and political scandals that would compromise our democratic process. The fact that so many of these spheres, the church, journalism, government, are now perceived as untrustworthy, irrelevant, lacking agility, impotent, or just dismissed as belonging to a particular tribal group is as much an indictment on their institutional inability to navigate complex times as it kind of shines a mirror on ourselves. We too, to some degree, are shallow creatures. We get frustrated by the slow arc of justice, impatient for results, and eager for scapegoats to explain away our pain. And so we choose the lowest hanging fruit, the platform that can make us feel righteous for a moment, the popular slogan, the quick condemnation. But we are often doing so as individuals, alone, facing these vast public issues and global trends by ourselves. We grasp at these like isolated, fleeting bursts of meaning, and we are finding ourselves dissatisfied and then still more tired and more confused as they just seem to yield only deeper division and positional entrenchment. We seem to have discarded, whether by omission or by choice, those bounded, small-scale opportunities to love and to serve, boundaried spheres through which to express and produce the goods for which that sphere was intended and not to blur other purposes into it. Too many of us, after having been formed by, that's funny, by covenant, and then I realized by covenant college, by a covenant in our youth um, and perhaps our college, have given up a lot of us um, on, our, on sort of those costly commitments that feed our souls and knit our disparate selves into coherence, either because we feel we are too busy or they involve the messy work of fallen people loving one another and we just can't handle the friction that is part and parcel of healthy human relationships. For all of yours and also my generation's push to have our whole selves seen and nourished, 
most of us are really reinforcing our felt disintegration with lives stretched, at least post-college, and I'm really not trying to scare you, but the decade after college is a bit of an adventure. Um, we sort of stretch between two, but only two, but necessary demands. These days, for a lot of people, that's work, and then the, the demands of the household. And then we seem to push out everything else in between that could, all the things that could exist between those two spaces just to survive amid overwhelming schedules and still more overwhelming global forces. The neighborhood has too often become a scene of inconvenience. The casual encounter just too much to handle as I just want to get going on everything on my plate. A lot of people feel like there's no time anymore to volunteer at the food bank or participate in the local town council. I need to make sure my boss doesn't need me while I scroll absentmindedly by the playground, spring, playground swing, my kids begging for my attention that I'm just too weary to give. It feels safer and more efficient to post a social media message that declares where I stand on a given issue than to do the messy, usually hidden work of repair. In all of this, we seem to be forgetting about our creatureliness, our design for interdependence, for needing others, and being woven into a tapestry that allows those needs to be expressed. We forget, actually, about the invitation that's embedded in our finitude and limitation, or at least our culture forgets it, pushing us often, even as Christian believers, to be similarly deceived. And we join the, uni I would say, uniquely American currents to think that limits are just de facto bad, Limits, not unlike suffering, are to be avoided, are to be overcome. It is our limits more often than not, our lack of feeling equipped, our inability to receive some, or to repair something intractable. It's those limits that just so often are the source of our anxiety and our fretting instead of the ingredient, maybe the crucial ingredient that God requires to do something beautiful. When I was in college, like you, I had a political science professor by the name of Mark Amstutz, now retired recently, and he was just a formidable figure for those of us interested in questions of real politique and how this faith called Christianity interacted on the public scene in global affairs. He combined a real respect for careful statecraft and tough moral realism. Diplomats and he introduced us to diplomats and national heroes who had helped countries get past the genocide in Rwanda, the bombings in Ireland, uh, people who were serving as peacemakers in Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and also what would become the Iraq War. But Dr. Ansys was also pastoral, seeking to prepare us for life and its inevitable sorrows and complexity. And I vividly remember one devotion at the start of class when he looked at us with a kind of fierce love, and he said this, If you haven't faced adversity, I feel sorry for you. And he said it again slowly and allowing the terrible words to sink into us. If you haven't faced adversity, I feel sorry for you. Most of us, of course, could point to moments of adversity by that point, familial losses, fears, broken romantic relationships. But given that it was a place like Wheaton, maybe not unlike Covenant, the bulk of us also came from stable households, growing up wrapped in love and a unique kind of attentiveness to presence with one another in our families, a presence often to the most important things of life, God, people, service, rituals of worship and learning and laughter and work. And so these words came as both kind of a stirring inspiration, a holy warning, but also a truth that we would need before we understood it. Fast forward quite a few years in my own life, and I've just begun to see something profound in this professor's pity. For in those times of loss in my own life, trauma, of being stripped bare and of being humbled by my own excesses and mistakes and sins, it is precisely in those times when my croaking prayers seem to be the most exponentially taken up, when the cruciform nature of love itself is most vividly experienced. It turns out that our stripping our bumping up against the limits of our powers, our skills, our fears, our relational patience, that this is actually the place our creator loves, creating from and starting with. What would it look like to design more of our institutions and our public policies from this? What might it look like to structure our collaborations in the puzzle pieces of our limits? How might a conception of our individual limits 
reshape and beautify a richer whole in our friendships? How might the particular contours of your finitude puzzle piece into the particular contours of mine? And then maybe we discover a greater gold in our communion. How might our felt limits and also honestly and particularly naming them redesign our prayers? Not in a way that is self-punishing, but in a way that turns the key for God's liberation. The magazine I get to lead uh, comment published a very poignant meditation just last week by a Croatian woman who'd endured the Bosnia-Serbia conflict years ago and who became a refugee with her family as a result. She now lives in Virginia, not far from me in DC, and I asked her to reflect now on what's happening in Ukraine. Is there something about wartime that should tell us something about peacetime? Her name is Irena Dragas Jensen. That was a Latin accent, but um, uh, she would say in a Croatian way, still rolling yours. And I'm going to read you just a portion of what she wrote. She wrote, what is war? What is peace? I keep asking if they are mutually exclusive as I am thrust back into the dramatic commingling of humanity's paradox watching what's happening in Ukraine. Does one exist only when the other does not? Life is not neatly divided into separate segments. Life is a convoluted pattern of sorrow, joy, anger, conflict, resolutions, tensions, kindness, fear, love, generosity, conceit, forgiveness, hatred, pain, healing, chaos, clarity, and God's presence. Always, God's presence. All this weaves an intricate pattern of life. This is true about life in a time of peace. It is also true about life in a time of war. The difference is that in war, the components become extremely exaggerated and exposed. The colossal fear that envelops the mood of war can so overwhelm that we become paralyzed or ignite previously unimaginable actions. Anger explodes and cannot be contained. Pain transforms into uncontrollable hatred. Reason is overtaken by unchecked emotions. All these seem to morph into a giant, unstoppable fireball of evil. She continued, right before the attack on our small town, many of our neighbors secretly left without warning us about the impending military action. These were the neighbors my sister and I played with daily. We went to the same school. My mom drank Turkish coffee with these friends most mornings. My dad shared his tools. We even went to church with some of them. But they did not warn us. It was the air raid sirens the next morning that did. As the war unraveled, brutal and vigilante style killings were committed by both sides. One of our neighbors was killed by a group of his work colleagues who showed up at his door. A close friend of mine only recently shared with me how one day a group of soldiers came into the retirement home where she was working and beat every elderly person who belonged to a certain ethnic group. Previously unimaginable actions, now fueled by fear, anger and hatred, exaggerated and exposed. And yet joy, kindness, and generosity also get amplified. Love in times of war can transform from an ethereal concept into incarnation and action, defending, protecting, sacrificing, giving. Stranger still, in wartime, love can become so embodied that it is indistinguishable from the pain and tears on suffering human faces. Virtue itself purifies to a crystalline shimmer defying the ashes of destruction and loss. At the very beginning of the war in Croatia, my dad's quiet and steady ways of loving us steadily grew into incredible acts of bravery. He was at work in a neighboring town when the attack on our hometown happened. Despite the advice of the Croatian military, he entered our town and forged his way to our house. We all gathered and it was decided that my dad would first drive our elderly neighbor to the hospital as she urgently needed kidney dialysis. Then the next day, he did it again. This time, he drove my mom, my sister, and me and out of our occupied town to safety. During the four years of being refugees, and despite moving six times and enduring profound personal loss and hardship, my parents turned to serving others, unloading, sorting, and distributing thousands of pounds of humanitarian aid, counseling and hosting people, sharing their limited resources with others. In the midst of it all, they continued trusting God, even when tears flowed. One of my Croatian friends said it well in her text message while we were checking up on each other's emotional welfare as our own war traumas re-emerged during the beginning of this war in Ukraine. 
Quote, she said, life narrows drastically in these circumstances. Only basics matter now, really. Warmth, food, mere survival. I replied to her, yes, the great stripping has begun. The bare branches way of living. It's time to grow even deeper roots. War is a season of an intense stripping down. It is a time of revealing what it is that upholds us. This process of stripping is not unique to war. War intensifies it and makes it more visible. But being stripped bare is a part of life, even life in peace. The German Lutheran theologian Hans jo Joachim Ivan once said, our faith begins at the point where atheists suppose it must be at an end. Our faith begins with the bleakness and power, which is the night of the cross, abandonment, temptation, and doubt about everything that exists. Our faith must be born where it is abandoned by all tangible reality. It must be born of nothingness and be given it to taste in a way that no philosophy of nihilism can imagine. This is such a paradox, but if our faith involves any kind of mathematics, I think this is part of the equation. These last few years, as we've all weathered COVID and the social combustion, it unleashed some predictable ways, some very surprising ways, at least to me. I've just been trying to understand the mysterious connection between pain and thriving, between individual limits and communal joy. What is the nature of this correlation? I've asked, what is the relationship between hitting rock bottom and the beginnings of the life that is really life? If I can answer that, might there be some clues to how a whole, society, a whole society could emerge from this more whole instead of emerging from it more broken? I had spent some years prior to the pandemic studying moral transformation and the communities that just changes for the better. And I consistently found that the most luminous examples would always land me back in like the same scarred sandbox. It was the prisons. It was the addiction recovery groups. It was the communities ravaged by fires and hurricanes and families forged in exile that held the keys to life at its truest. You could try to copy the rituals they developed and scale the principles they discovered, but without an experience of struggle and suffering and loss, without the shared scars, the replicating sauce would be diluted, yielding maybe fleeting shadows at best. There was just no getting around the fact that if you cared about positive growth, what we might call sanctification in our tradition, if you cared about positive growth, both for individuals and for society, somewhere along the way, there had to be a surrendering of rights, of pride, of denials and masks, and a willingness to be taken to the end of oneself. Only then were new beginnings rightly ordered. Only then was there hope of becoming whole. A few months ago, I spoke at some length with a victim of a mass shooting on a college campus. She had lost her hand in a terrible way, though she had survived the ordeal, and she then endured months of excruciating physical therapy to put her hand back together, and she still now suffers as a mom holding her baby through pain and clumsiness and, and using her hand. She was isolated, and she was supported, but she was also like psychically isolated in the healing and recovery as so few friends and family, however well-intended, just were unable to join her in the trauma of seeing a man walk in and point a gun to your head. She's a white woman, and this whole experience caused her to stretch, much to her own surprise, into subcultures she had not known, suffering she had not seen, cultural blindnesses she had previously dismissed, across lines of race and class and geography and story. And she now serves as an advocate and an ally, a friend and someone who's really willing to lose herself in service of others' gain. In her unwanted imposition of limits on her own freedom, both physical and psychological, she has found a new capacity to love and be loved. Her experience of deep waters of dependence, yielding just a wider aperture for human pain and God's tears to hold those wounds in his wounds and thereby transform the world. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. I am coming to you today in what feel to me like very taxing and harsh times. Myself having to learn again and again that beneath all of what I believe to be true about the nature of things like the gift 
about joy, about beauty, and about love, all have sort of a paradox wrapped up in them, something that actually depends on our finitude being offered to the finitude of others before God who is the great finisher of the puzzles of our pieces. I'm here to encourage you not to be afraid to name and acknowledge felt limits and limitations, be they bodily, cognitive, psychological, bandwidth related, even moral, and to consider how they might bring you closer to others and not put a barrier between you and bring you ultimately closer to God. To consider how our limits as individuals, as institutions, communities, as a nation, might actually map, provide a map of the way forward from which we better design the spheres and lanes that need to themselves respect limits and appropriate boundaries in order to make productive headway on the wicked problems afflicting our age. It turns out we just weren't created to stand athwart oceanic forces by ourselves. We are made for discrete roles and committed relationships and often a very particular place and at the end of it all, a mortal bodily life to see, funnily enough, the way that God sees, to see the infinite glory of eternity. As Reinhold Niebuhr famously said, nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime, therefore we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history, therefore we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. No virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the final form of love, which is forgiveness. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for our lives and this particular time and the particular places in which we find ourselves. We thank you for the particularities of our stories that brought us to you and even the particularity of our wounds. We offer to you our own sense of overwhelm and limits and numbness. And we ask for the grace of wonderful friendships who can help us laugh and uh, stretch us in ways we can't ourselves, who give us limbs that we don't have. Um, and we ask for the courage to present our own bounded selves to you for boundless love that is your purpose. We thank you for how you modeled all of this in Christ himself in his name. Amen.